Uh, so it's, it's my pleasure to uh, virtually uh, uh, introduce Greg uh, Kurtzer, who is a, the current CEO of uh, Control IQ. Uh, and many of you know him from his past exploits at LBNL uh, and elsewhere uh, in the open source uh, software space, both as a, um, a developer and founder for several projects, uh, including Singularity, Werewolf, uh, Rocky Linux, uh, Perseus, uh, among others. So today, Greg's going to give us a high level view uh, of what he sees as the future for uh, HPC involving the orchestration and, and management of uh, disparate resources across uh, various resource centers. Uh, and in this, uh, this idea of, of uh, uh, sort of bringing together the best pieces of uh, different facets of, of uh, compute to push forward HPC 2.0. So great, go ahead and. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and it's great to see everybody. I see a lot of familiar names here. Uh, so it's great to see y'all again. Um, at some point, we're all gonna have to get together as I come back up to the lab and I'm still uh, in Berkeley. So uh, at least part-time I'm in Berkeley. So it'd be great to see you all again, face-to-face uh, -face at some point. So this is a presentation um, that's kind of co-opted from one that I did uh, at the Canopy uh, workshop that uh, Andrew Young uh, from Sandia and a few others um, have led. And, and this was at Supercomputing, well, virtually at Supercomputing. Uh, and, and Canopy is containers and new orchestration paradigms for isolated environments in HPC. And it occurred to me that if we just change the isolated to integrated, it seemed to align a lot more with, I think, um, uh, with re really where we need to be going and where we need to be thinking about from an HPC perspective. I'll apologize ahead of time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, uh, first and foremost. Uh, the, my, my new role is basically just basically playing with Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoints at this point, but um, I, I've now been coined and tagged as coming off a little bit marketing and sales wise, which is just hurts my, um, hurts my heart <laughs> to be called that, but um, I, I don't mean this to be a marketing talk. This is more about just really how we're thinking about this and what got us to this point. Uh, so if you do have technical questions at the end, uh, absolutely, please hammer me with them. Um, I'm not at all uh, thinking that this is, you know, the end all. This is just how we're thinking about this, and what. And and again, I'm going to kind of walk you through how we got to this place. Uh, and I would love feedback. So all of that said, uh, I'll start with a quick introduction um, to what it is that we've been we've been up to. So uh, we started um, about two years ago. And we were founded specifically to start looking at uh, more modern ways of doing high performance computing. And this was being driven predominantly out of the traditional HPC sector. Uh, we've been saying this in, in HPC for as long as I've been in HPC that enterprise and cloud needs to, well, cloud wasn't existing when I first got in HPC, but enterprise needs to be taking over a lot of these HPC resources. And, and this is gonna translate directly to what enterprise is doing and, and whatnot. Yeah, that's, that's so far that's never happened. Um, but I think now's different. <laughs> of course, everyone always thought that previously that now's different, but I do think now is different. And I'll explain why in just a moment, but this was originally kind of started off being kind of HPC for non HPCers. And uh, what I've learned since then is most HPC sites are thinking about this as well. And they're thinking that we need to be modernizing, we need to be changing and rethinking kind of the base structure, the fundamental structure of high-performance computing. And I'm kind of going off script a little bit now just because I'm, I'm riffing on this, but that was what we were founded to do. That was the beginning of this. Now, as we looked at the, the portfolio of projects that I've been associated with, uh, we realized that, well, it's not just about the middleware. Uh, we also have to be looking at this more inclusively. And we had a number of organizations that were either running something like OpenHPC or they're just using Werewolf. And they asked us to, to help them with Werewolf as well. So Werewolf kind of became part of the planned uh, go-to-market strategy for what it is that we were building. 
And um, uh, I also, uh, as, as Jonathan mentioned, I created um, a Singularity and I created Singularity when I was still back at, at LBL um, and I collaborated quite a bit with, um, with Doug and Shane and absolutely appreciated um, the relationship that I have with, with, with them. Fantastic. I, I think I saw, I think I saw Doug, I think I saw, saw you here. Um, uh, I can't see everybody now, but uh, I apologize if, if I'm, if, if I didn't, or if I'm leaving anyone out, but uh, Singularity was created at Berkeley Lab. Um, uh, since then, we've recently, I pushed um, Singularity um, into the Linux Foundation, just because I wanted to ensure that it will stay and remain as a open source platform for the community. And I felt really, um, I felt really good about making sure that that's going to stay into the open source community, as well as have good relations with non HPC portions of the community like CNCF. Uh, so uh, that close alignment, I think was really good. And they asked me to change the name. So um, we put together a vote and ended up with Aptainer. And then lastly, Rocky Linux, I'm also a founder of CentOS, uh, which is used obviously by a lot of high performance computing sites, among others in the ecosystem. And when Red Hat decided to pull the plug on that um, and, and pivot the project, uh, you know, Rocky Linux was born. Uh, I was associated with that. And as a result, a lot of people now have asked us to also do support for Rocky Linux. So this is kind of what we do at a, at a high level. Um, and now that I'm past that, I'm going to jump right into kind of the tech of fuzzball and, and what got us here. So uh, I'm assuming that pretty much everyone in the room is familiar with the traditional Beowulf. Um, it's an almost 30 year old architecture and it served our needs extraordinarily well. Almost every HPC system sold and used and architected is based on this model. Um, we've done a lot to be able to scale this model up and be able to do additional things with this, but the core model is a relatively legacy architecture at this point, and it's made it very difficult to integrate with a lot of capabilities that have been um, accelerated in cloud hyperscale and enterprise, things like orchestration, um, CI, CD, and there's a number of others that I'll show in, in a later slide, but this monolithic kind of legacy architecture has made it very difficult to in incorporate a lot of those, those capabilities. And um, uh, any Pink Floyd um, <laughs> fans in the room, uh, you know, we, we haven't really innovated uh, very much on the base architecture side, but we've absolutely innovated on everything else. Um, but the base architecture could definitely use a little bit of um, rethinking uh, as, I'm, as I've been considering. Also, we've seen, we're seeing that the HPC landscaping itself is changing. We're seeing use cases are getting a heck of a lot more complicated. Um, and I actually think the big pivot that we've had within the last you know, six-ish years in, in HPC really was started by containers. Um, I think containers and the desire to integrate with containers all of a sudden caused the HPC community to actually look at what the rest of the enterprise and cloud was doing. And I think that became kind of the gateway drug. Uh, so um, it's Pandora's box or Pandora's container, I think, really started that. Um, but in addition to that, we're also seeing, again, we're seeing a lot more uh, job diversity and types of jobs coming in. And eight traditional HPC centers are now being tasked to come up with solutions for non-traditional high-performance computing applications. Um, usage models, um, when I was talking about uh, building a cluster with many enterprises, a common theme would be, well, SSH is for system administrators, not users. As a matter of fact, even most of the, the bigger enterprises that I spoke to said, actually, SSH isn't even used by system administrators anymore. Um, everything should be you know, deployed and provisioned and managed via some other form, you know, Ansible, Puppet, you know, whatever, CF Engine, um, if, if you're old like me. Um, so <laughs> there's a whole lot of kind of different ways of doing this, and they don't even want system administrators using SSH. So usage models have shifted considerably, but we're still using this in, in traditional high performance computing. We're seeing a lot of issues with security, um, and we're trying to make things easier. Uh, you know, we used to have a joke that almost every HPC system we built was serial number one uh, in the sense that every system was kind of custom built 
and it was there was not a huge amount of of cookie cutter and scale for for the commodity sweet spot high performance computing. It's been a number of initiatives to try to do that. Open HPC is a great one, but even with that said, it needs further democratization. Um, and then again, enterprise computing uh, needs, which are more things like AI, ML, uh, ML ops, and and so on and so forth. All right, so just to kind of demonstrate this, I'm going to walk everyone through a story. And uh, this this happened. This is and it's not quite verbatim. It, you know, uh, the names have been uh, changed to protect the innocent and and whatnot. But uh, the general gist of this is exactly kind of how the conversation went. And uh, so I was I was contacted by one of the biggest social media companies. I'm not going to name them, but you can probably guess uh, in the world who basically came to me and brought me into their office and said, hey, Greg, we're going to be the biggest HPC system in the world. And of course, you know, I ask how, right? Well, we're going to take a rack. And in that rack, we're going to make it really dense. We're going to put like 100 compute nodes in there. We're going to put disaggregated memory, you know, uh, composable hardware, uh, storage system, uh, network subsystem, and a control surface. And that's going to be our base system. So this is kind of what they're talking about. Um, you know, some of us in high performance computing have been thinking about this, but this is really more of kind of an OCP type uh, way of thinking of the world or a hyperscaler way of thinking of the world. Um, and, and they're really kind of moving towards a lot of composable resources and disaggregated memory is an interesting one. Um, you know, remote GPUs, um, PCI switches and switching and all, all that sort of composable infrastructure. And so it's definitely really kind of a neat um, neat system, but you know, it's, it's really not big. Um, but their response to me was, well, <laughs> we're, we're hyperscalers. That's just one system. We're going to put together thousands of these. And so, yeah, I start thinking, well, there's one <laughs> of these. There's 25 of these at 2,500 nodes. There's 100 of these at 10,000 nodes. And yeah, I did math in my head really, really good and quick. Like, yeah, that's 100,000 compute nodes. Okay, yeah, that's that's pretty big. Um and that's actually not a scaling model that we typically think of for high performance computing is to tie together thousands of individual discrete clusters into a giant system. Um, we typically think of it from the other perspective of let's make a giant flat system and just make that as big as possible. So it's a kind of a, it's a subtle but a different way of thinking about this. And, and there was more. Right. Um, Obviously, you can't put this all in one place. Um, I jokingly say you'd need a nuclear reactor to power it and an ocean to cool it. And, um, and where's your data, right? So it has to be scattered all over the world, or, or, or at least geographically. But the data that they were talking about is exabytes in size, and that is sharded all over the world, which should be, you know, any, anyone, you know, we all should be probably thinking, well, how are you going to match up then where the workloads are running to which cluster onto which data? And where is that data? And how do you manage that data, right? You don't want to mirror exabytes of data because they keep their data mostly in object store. So you don't want to mirror that onto spinning disks. So you have to be thinking about where, how are you going to manage the data as part of this? Um, they've got massive numbers of users. And I should say they're not just all users. Many of these are um, uh, sources of different types, but they do have, you know, tens of thousands of, of, of users even. Uh, I already talked a little bit about job diversity, event driven, all right? Not, you don't always want to submit uh, a job by hand, right? A lot of this needs to happen automatically based on various hooks, um, maybe pipelines. Uh, it needs to be absolutely federated, right? We, we need to completely distribute this and manage all of that distribution of resources and distribution of, of jobs and workflows in a way that is a function of resources. Where are those resources, physical resources, the cost of running on those resources and data. And when we're thinking of data, we're thinking of data locality, data mobility, gravity, and security. So there's a lot of kind of functions to be thinking about when we're thinking about a gigantic geographically distributed federated solution. And then, of course, I already talked about supply chain security um, and, of course, the data management policies. Uh, so when, when we start thinking about what's needed to build this, we have to start thinking about this from a kind of a different perspective. I mean, it not only needs to support traditional HPC, 
but it also needs to support kind of newer types of HPC or HPC like workloads like enterprise computing. Um, obviously, this is, you know, the P in HPC is performance. We've got to be performant. Um, you know, it, just as, as you look at this from an enterprise perspective, most people are just thinking about this. Well, let's just throw Kubernetes to be our, our whole job resource management system and whatnot. Um, the people that have done this um, that I've spoken with, most of them have said, yeah, but it's not really great on the performance side and it kind of gets in the way. So we've got to build something that's doing better than Kubernetes um, and built design for this. We have to be able to hit massive scale and not just horizontal and vertical scaling, but also the, the meta orchestration of the federated scaling, which maybe it's almost like a Z axis scaling, All right? We need to be thinking about data management, composable workflows, um, um, just, I don't want to read off a wall of text because that just feels weird to me. So I'm looking through here and, um, you can kind of see, I mean, cloud integration, there's one that, you know, since, since I was even back at LBL, since about 2005, 2006, um, there's been initiatives to move HPC into the cloud. And, um, and we've always been asked by management about moving HPC into the cloud and what are we going to, how are we going to do that? The current HPC model makes that extraordinarily difficult. It's possible, but it's, but it's very difficult and it's a little clunky. But if we can do this as a first-class citizen in this in the system, right? That kind of changes the paradigm. Um, if I'm going to move on. I'll share these slides. So if anybody wants to come back to them afterwards. So many very astute people in HPC have been able to build into build in some of these capabilities on top of traditional HPC. Definitely possible. Um, building all of them in, I would challenge anyone to, to do, and I would actually challenge the logic of it. Um, it's, it's, to me, it, it seems like it's overly complicated trying to shoehorn in a, a series of capabilities around a legacy architecture. It just seems easier and, and um, better just to rethink that architecture and see, you know, is there a better way of doing this that is better aligned? Um, and there's a lot of capabilities that have come out of enterprise cloud and hyperscale that historically have been distinct and separate from what we're doing in high performance computing. I think if we start looking at how do we build a more um, capable and compatible infrastructure, all of a sudden we can start cross pollinating and further innovating and then leveraging each other's kind of um, uh, major value adds and innovations. And I think that that's the way that we need to be thinking about this moving forward. So that's um, <laughs> why CIQ was created to basically do all of that. Uh, we started putting together a platform called Fuzzball. And um, the way I describe this at a high level um, it is a cloud, um, cloud native federated um, computing platform. And I'll talk a little bit now about kind of what it, what it does and how it does it. So workflows need to really support um, three major aspects from, from my perspective, and there may be more. Uh, we, we may need to further extend on this, but at least at a fundamental level, data, data and volumes. We need to be able to define in a workflow what data we need, what containers we need, what resources we need um, in terms of IO. We need to pull that in and we need to manage that accordingly as part of the entire workflow, as a, as a, a primary member of that workflow. From a compute perspective, um, we wanna think of this as more than just a job manager or a batch manager. We want to think of this in terms of an entire workflow manager. And a workflow consists not only of the data and the volumes, but it also consists of um, acyclic graphs that can define what a series of jobs or job pipeline can look like. And obviously, you can do it in just one job if you want, but we need to be able to support more complicated aspects and even start getting into things like ML ops and bring in a lot of the capabilities of ML ops into more traditional compute. I think there's a lot of crossover that we could be benefiting from there. And we also need to define the resources. What resources are necessary to properly complete this particular, um, this particular workflow? And resources may be different for each individual job that's running within a workflow. And so we need to be able to manage that uh, accordingly. Um, and with all of that, 
kind of inclusively, we can now start to create composable HPC resources for each particular job and workflow that needs to run. And so I, I've got a bunch of examples. I'm gonna start with a example workflow um, and then I'm gonna go into the architecture and I'm gonna show some more workflows. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a workflow that we always just kind of seem to come back to because it describes a number of different um, things within it. Uh, at the top, you can see in the image, um, uh, you know, abstractly, we're basically taking some input data, we run it through a pipeline of containers, and then we persist the output data from that to another source. So again, bring ingest um, of, of data, run it through your, your graph pipeline, and then persist what you need again to another, it could be an object store, it could be a data lake, it could be the same place that you got the original data source from. Um, but what we're creating is a way of describing the entire workflow in a way that that workflow could run anywhere. And we leave it then up to the system to decide based on the requirements of the workflow and what's inside the workflow, we can make logical decisions as to where that job um, or workflow should run. So just to kind of run through this real quick so everyone kind of has a, a base kind of uh, idea of what we're thinking of when we talk about this. So the workflow has two predominant um, kind of pieces. The first one is volumes and the second one is jobs. This, in the, in the volume section, we create a volume called V1. This volume is ephemeral. So this volume will be blown away as soon as the job is done. We're gonna ingress a few sources. Now, one of the things, even though this volume is ephemeral, we have the ability to cache the sources. So subsequent jobs that require the same sources could have an affinity to land on the same resources. So we can basically now ingress data, create this volume, ingress this data, um, and pre-populate this volume with that data. Now the egress is what happens when the job is done. What, is the, what data are we going to take out of this volume and put somewhere else? So, in terms of how this operates, we first create the volume, we bring in the ingress. Egress happens when the job pipeline is done. So I'm gonna jump over to jobs. First job that we're gonna do is just to untar this data. You can see we're pulling over a tarball here, putting it at input.tar.gz, and we're mounting this volume at slash data. So we're basically gonna take that input.tarz that we wrote right here, and we're just going to splat it out to slash data. The next job is basically a UFS model. Notice we're running in a different container for each one of these. So this UFS model is an MPI application. We're just pulling this straight out of Docker Hub. Um, we're going to basically specify um, you know, what, you know, where the volume is getting mounted. It's getting mounted in a different location here. It's an MPI job. And this, by the way, is, is very um, simplistic. There's a lot more capabilities and resources that you can specify associated with a particular job. Like what are the specific node requirements? How many cores do you need? How much memory do you need? Um, how long is the job going to run? What are policies you're going to associate with this job? Um, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of capabilities in here, but this is a very simplistic example just to kind of demonstrate the fundamental concept. Um, and we're gonna run this weather model through an open MPI, um, MPI implementation and run it across 128 nodes. And at the end, once that job is done, and by the way, you can see that there's a job pipeline but via the requires tag. So NCL requires UFS, UFS requires UNTAR. UNTAR will thus has no requirements, so that'll run first. So NCL is basically just going to visualize the job that we just ran here and basically drop a few PNG files. And those PNG files, once this is done, gets persisted through the egress. So hopefully that whole kind of process makes sense. Um, we have no, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? No religion in terms of the format of this file. Um, it's parsed by a particular piece of the, um, uh, of, the, of the system that can be easily modified and or completely replaced. So if there's a different organization or, or API that we want to implement here, it's actually, it's very easy. All right, so if we, if we think of what we've created, it's really, it's more of like an HPC platform as a service. And I'm going to kind of describe now what a cluster looks like. And it's a little different than, than what I think most people are used to. 
but it also has some similarities. So I'm going to start with the management cluster um, here in the bottom left. Uh, we're going to run some basic operating system. We're going to run Kubernetes, and we run Kubernetes only in the management cluster because what we've created with Fuzzball is, in fact, a microservice platform. So we want to run on top of you know, a microservice orchestrator. Uh, you could use Kubernetes, um, you could use any version of Kubernetes that you want. Uh, we don't care. We have a fantastic relationship with Rancher and SUSE. So um, we would definitely you know, like it if somebody wants to run Rancher or SUSE, but you can run anything, as I said, anything that you want. Uh, we've packaged up a version of Kubernetes just to make it easier for people that doesn't have another Kubernetes, but whatever you want to do here is absolutely fine. Fuzzball Orchestrate will come via Helm, sit on top of Kubernetes, and create kind of the management subsystem. Now, the resource cluster is um, very lightweight. Each, at least each node is very lightweight, what's installed on in the node. Again, we're gonna do some sort of provisioning. Whatever you wanna use here is fine. Whatever operating system you wanna use here is fine. We're, we're, we're not bound by any of the uh, kind of underlying fundamentals. You can do anything you want. Substrate, Fuzzball Substrate is called Substrate specifically because it is the foundation of where all jobs and workloads will run. It is kind of the, um, the init process in a matter of speaking of all, uh, all other compute processes. What Fuzzball Substrate actually is, it is a API driven container hypervisor and um, runtime. It, the API is specific around leases and you have the ability to ask Substrate for a lease. And you can do this either, either by hand via a CLI, or it will connect into orchestrate. So what could happen is you can say, I need two GPUs. I need this number of cores on this many sockets or these particular sockets. I need this much memory. And you define and you, you request a lease for all of the hardware requirements that you need, <coughs> excuse me, for a particular workflow or job. Fuzzball will tell, Substrate will tell and respond if that's possible and we will then hold the lease. Orchestrate, is a set of microservices that will control Fuzzball substrates. So Fuzzball Orchestrate has microservices like a workflow engine. It has a data mover, image service, volume manager, job scheduler, and so on and so forth. So when a workflow comes in from a user or from a CI pipeline, it will automatically be ingested by Orchestrate and Orchestrate will start setting up the composable resources to, to satisfy this job requirement. It will basically, again, it'll move the data and you can kind of see this outlined here on the right, right? It'll ingress data, create a volume, create a job pipeline of containers that sit on top of that and then egress your data out of there, anything you want to persist. And it manages all of this. The user API for this is coming in via uh, gRPC. There's no SSH. Every API in the system is governed by an IAM policy engine that we wrote and we designed. Um, to basically manage policies of what every user is allowed to do for every step of the process. So basically this workflow comes in, everything has been defined by system administrators and by organizational policies on what each user is allowed to do, what are the defaults for each user, and then how this whole thing operates. We've had a number of requests of how do we even control the data that a particular user is requesting. So we can even control the data that a user is requesting, um, make sure that that user and workflow is allowed to access that data based on things like cryptographic signatures. Um, so there's a lot of functionality and a lot of places to, um, to add capability into this workflow. But what's really cool about this, what even cooler in my mind than everything else that we've already done is how this actually interacts with other systems. So imagine you have one of those clusters up in AWS, you have one in Azure, maybe you have one cluster on-prem, maybe you have another site, another cluster on another site, maybe there's another organization that you're working with and they've got a cluster, um, and so on and so forth, via the third piece of fed, uh, Fuzzball, which is called Federate. And what Federate allows us to do is to create organizational policies based on where should applications land. So as the, as the workflow comes in, we now get to make scheduling and policy decisions that are kind of, as I alluded to before, they're unlike typically the, the types of policy decisions we've made before in the past. We get to make decisions based on 
but where are those resources, right? Is this, is this workflow coming in? Does it require ARM? Does it require power? Does it require x86? Does it require particular GPUs that maybe one site has and another site does not? Um, what is the cost of running at one site versus another? And again, if you're talking about on-prem uh, on sites, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but if you're talking about cloud, right? There's definitely a factor there that we need to be considering. Or if you're talking about running on a collaborator site, you know, maybe there's a cost associated with that. And then of course the data, right? And we have data locality, I think it was mobility, gravity, and data security that we need to be considering. So all of those decisions are now being made at the Fuzzball Federate level. So when a workflow comes in, we now can say, okay, well, the data for this exists over here, but the compute requirement exists over here, but maybe we can run it up in the cloud and do this. And that whole policy can be defined by the organization. Users using this system may never even have access or even knowledge to what the policy is. From their perspective, everything is completely transparent. They just submit this workflow and it runs where it needs to run. All right, um, I'm gonna keep blowing through this real quick, get through this, and then I, I'm hoping that there's gonna be some cool dialogue and Q&A afterwards. So I'm gonna touch real quick on, um, here, here's just what some of the CLI looks like. Um, you, know, you create a context, a context. So a Fuzzball CLI can actually be connecting to many separate Fuzzball instances. So each instance is a context, very similar to uh, Kubernetes. So you have multiple fuzzball contexts and you can choose to use any one of them at any particular point and switch. You can um, uh, submit a workflow uh, to the system. Again, this is running on a laptop or on a workstation, not on the system. We are not SSH into the system. So you can start a workflow, you can monitor a workflow, you can attach to workflows, you can exec um, uh, a, you know, a shell in a workflow and something I'll show in just a moment, you can even redirect network ports um, from a particular workflow to your end client. And now think about how cool that is when we start thinking about things like remote virtual uh, visualization and Jupyter Hub. So in terms of workflows, I showed kind of the UFS example, but here's just a few other things that kind of demonstrate some of its capabilities. Uh, task arrays, so we can actually have a, a, a job within the workflow that's basically going to start spinning on some sort of an array. Obviously do MPI, and here you can see a very basic and simple resource, <coughs> excuse me, request. Persistent volumes is another type of volume that we have in addition to ephemeral. Persistent volumes is basically could be used when a particular system um, or, or resource has data that is associated with that and already kind of pre-populated. So um, uh, on the LBL side, when I was, when I was there, we worked with uh, the astrophysicists um, with a, uh, a project called Sloan, uh, which was a digital sky survey. And they had massive amounts of data associated with a particular cluster. And they were, they were mirroring that data to multiple sites. Uh, Princeton was a site uh, and there was, there was a few other sites. Princeton had a whole, a whole mirror of the of the data. Other sites just had small pieces and small chunks of that data. Well, if we were to be able to use something like Fuzzball for this, we can say that each one of these sites have a, a whole set of different persistent data, data that's already associated with that particular site. And this could be genomics, it could be, it could be whatever. Um, Fuzzball will now make sure that this job or the workflow will land where that persistent data exists. So if you have uh, and there's one big assumption that we make, and not to get too far into persistent volumes, but there's one big assumption we make, which is um, nomenclature of the persistent volume is very important. So if you have two clusters that have the same nomenclature, we're going to make an assumption that those are mirror copies of each other. So this workflow can land on either of those. And then we can make decisions based on other attributes of the workflow of where that should land. But persistent volumes, um, and you can, by the way, via IM policies, you can specify what users are allowed to, to mount this up with read write versus read only um, access. And we can also govern that all the way down to the POSIX um, uh, user security side, um, all the way when the job actually runs. Um, here's an, a benchmark that we did, which is just the HPL AI benchmark um, from NVIDIA. We did this on some DGXs. Uh, and we got the, uh, obviously this, I think this should go without saying, but just to state it, state the obvious, we got the exact same performance 
Um, actually, we didn't get exactly the same. We got a little bit better performance, but I think that was just because um, when we ran it on bare metal, we didn't peg um, CPU affinity or anything. Fuzzball automatically does that. So for all equivalent purposes, it ran exactly the same uh, as was expected. Um, let's see, whoops, there we go. Gromax, uh, just to demonstrate GPUs. Blast, this one's really interesting. And again, I'm gonna send this out to you so you, you all can read through this. But this one's really interesting because we actually use a job in the workflow to actually do pre-population of data inside of the volume. You'll see the volume's created, but there's no ingress. And that's because the ingress is done here. Uh, lamps, I'm assuming you guys are all familiar with this these sort of workflows um, and whatnot. Uh, what's really interesting actually here is we can jump, and this is, a, this is an experiment we did for TCO comparison of NVIDIA DGX to AMD GPUs. Uh, we were able to change where the job landed based on simply changing the container that we're leveraging and the GPU um, specified, specifically the CUDA here. Uh, change that to Rockham. We're able to put a different container here that's built for Rockham. And without changing anything else, we can do an exact back-to-back -back comparison. Uh, for many years, we've been kind of uh, vendor locked in by CUDA. What containers have actually done, one of the real cool attributes of containers here, is we've actually changed the interface point for most scientists from, from being at the library level to at the basically the container level, or rather the CLI inside of that container. So without changing anything else, again, just change what container we're using and what GPU we're using and, and uh, Fuzzball will automatically land that on an AMD system if one exists versus an NVIDIA system. And again, you can kind of do back-to-back -back comparisons. And the last one I'm gonna show is Jupyter Hub. I mentioned we can do port redirection. Um, so user submits a workflow that kind of looks like this. Um, notice the network isolated is true. This basically gives us the ability to do that port rep um, uh, um, forwarding. And then when we, we start the workflow with this command, we get a log of the output using this, and we get the URL um, that we need to hit, including this token. And, um, and then we basically just do a port forward. From that workflow, um, local port, excuse me, remote port to local port, and you can literally just put that into your, into your web browser on your existing system, because it's gonna do that port forward all the way down to your end system, very much like an SSH tunnel. So it makes it real easy now for users to implement this. And of course we can wrap this and this is all API. So you can wrap this however you want. Um, you can even make a web interface for all of this if, if so desired um, or integrate with open on demand. Um, and yeah, we're, we're currently in early access and POCs now. Um, obviously just email me directly. You don't have to email <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, so that was, uh, really just designed to do a quick overview in terms of our justification. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? And uh, hopefully set the stage for some good, good Q&A and dialogue at this point.